Welcome to the Baker Tilly U.S. Podcast, an online community developed to connect you to our partners and leaders across the globe. Subscribe today to continue discovering new and unique ways that Baker Tilly can enhance or protect your value as we discuss timely, relevant, and impactful topics. Our current series is specific to real estate professionals. We recognize that the coronavirus is affecting real estate companies and organizations across the world in unique ways. In this podcast, we will speak with Baker Tilly practice group leaders about practical real estate guidance to help you through the next several weeks and to prepare your business and employees to come back strong in the future. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Buzz House, our Baker Tilly weekly podcast where you can find all the buzz affecting multifamily housing. I'm Don Bernard, the partner in charge of Baker Tilly's multifamily housing practice. And I'll be talking with my cohort and partner, Derek Gibson, who also specializes in consulting and multifamily transactions around the country. We are extremely delighted to have a guest in the Buzz House with us today. Joining us is Laura Cataldo, Senior Consulting Manager with Baker Tilly's Construction and Real Estate Team. Laura works with contractors across the country on business performance and management effectiveness. She is very active on the national level with construction trade and labor associations, providing her insight and global perspectives on how the construction industry is adapting to the challenges they are facing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Derek and I have a number of questions we'll pose to Laura around thoughts that developers of multifamily housing are having or should be having around the construction process. But first, we wanna highlight a few other things that were being discussed around the industry this week. The number of unemployment claims are up to 36 and a half million people since mid-March. The Federal Reserve released a report last week that noting just in the month of March 2020 alone, for those households earning less than $40,000 of income per year, 40% of them have lost their jobs, 40% in just the month of March. We again lead with these statistics as the multifamily industry still braces for a large drop in collected rents. However, through discussion with our clients and reading other industry surveys, generally speaking, May rent collections are trending well even slightly ahead of April rent collections, which weren't down a significant percentage uh, across the industry. However, with unemployment continuing to climb and some of the CARES Act provisions impact already past us, there is of course concern for the next couple of months until jobs start to come back, so we'll keep you in the loop on this activity. Many of you have been following the House's Health and Economic Recovery Omnibus Emergency Solutions, or HEROES Act. The bill was introduced on May 12th and quickly passed the House on May 15th. The bill does include a number of measures providing supplemental resources for housing, which we'll discuss, but of course does not include any provisions around the low-income housing tax credit. Obvious note that it became apparent quickly that this house package was going to focus on issues seen as emergencies throughout the economy and society as opposed to industry-specific matters. Although it could be noted as a 4% tax credit percentage of 3.08, which Garrick spent a lot of time in last week's podcast on, is a direct result of the pandemic and is causing issues with this tax credit program. Derek, let's get back to the HEROES Act and what's included. Would you be able to give a quick summary of the main provisions, uh, specifically around the housing industry? I certainly can, Don. The HEROES Act, we got $100 billion for a new emergency rental assistance program. As discussed on this podcast last week, under the bill, emergency rental assistance would be distributed. This funding could be used for short and medium-term rental assistance and rent-related costs, including utility payments, rent and utility and arrears, and security and utility deposits. At least 40% of the appropriated fund, funding would have to be used to assist individuals or families experience Thing or at risk of homelessness with incomes less than 30% of, of the AMI, the area median gross income, at least 70% of the funding would have to be used to serve individuals or families experience or at risk of homelessness earning less than 50% of AMI and recipients would, would, be, uh, would be able to use the remainder of the funds to serve individuals or households earning up to 80% who are at risk of or experiencing homelessness. So recipients can use funding to assist households earning up to 120% of AMI in some circumstances. Um, Another point is 75 billion, as we discussed in our last podcast, for homeowners struggling with mortgage payments and property taxes. There is a 11.5 billion in homeless assistance grants, 5 billion for community development block grants, and some additional dollars for tenant-based rental assistance and public housing operations. Um, the HEROES Act also includes another $1,200 for individuals. 
note that this is largely a messaging document that lays the groundwork for negotiations with the Senate Republicans. So we will keep our eyes um, out on this dialogue. And regarding discussions on fixing the 4% rate and other live tech provisions, these may have to come as part of a recovery bill as opposed to these emergency responses. Again, we will keep our eyes out for this dialogue and we'll cross our fingers nonetheless. Thank you, Garrick, for those updates on HEROES. As Garrick said, we'll keep you up to date on what's, what's moving forward. Now, as noted at the start of the program, we are very excited to begin a discussion with our colleague, Laura Cataldo, where we'll focus on the impact on the pandemic on your construction process. Laura, thank you again for joining us. We understand that construction has been an essential business in most states. However, there, of course, have to be safety protocols around construction sites for both employees and tenants if in a rehab. Laura, what should our developers want to address or know about health and safety concerns from their contractors? Yeah, thanks, Don, for inviting me to join you today. While construction was, dece was deemed essential in many states, contractors have faced the same challenges as other essential businesses. Workers concerned over exposure and required increased measures to protect the health and safety of employees. It is important for developers to stay closely connected with their contractors in order to protect the health of their own employees, the contractor's employees, and the residents. The nature of construction has always required the use of PPE in order to protect workers. But COVID-19 required contractors to put additional protections in place. It is common today that contractors are temperature screening any individual that enters the job site. One contractor that I recently spoke with uses colored armbands to identify employees once they've been tested for the day. Some interior trades are working multiple shifts to allow proper distancing or reduce the number of workers on the site at one time. And most contractors are staggering breaks and conducting job site meetings with technology in order to meet the physical distancing requirements. Developers should be asking the contractor what safety protocols are in place to evaluate employee health, communicate on the job site or limit gatherings. And lastly, many contractors are embracing prefabrication right now as a way to alleviate the challenges of worker distancing and compromised schedules. Fabricating the components off-site, delivering them to the site, and then installing might be an effective way to minimize the number of workers on your site without negatively impacting the schedule. Thanks, Laura. That, that's very interesting. There's a, a lot of talk in the industry about the possibility of supply chain issues regarding building materials getting to the construction sites. First, what is your experience with this? And second, how can developers be proactive working with architects and GCs to avoid these issues to the extent they, they, they can even, they can? Yeah, thanks, Garrick. You know, I, I just got off a call with mid, a number of large um, general contractors from around the country that are part of a, a task force that I serve on. We're talking about what they're seeing and supply chain issues um, absolutely hit the top of the list in the conversations we were having. AGC of America has been surveying its contractor members from across the country over the last two months to measure the impact of the pandemic on the industry. And a growing number of contractors are reporting material shortages and delays, especially from products sourced overseas. One of the attendees on the call today referenced flooring that was coming from Belgium that's been on the boat and is waiting to be unloaded in New York and there's no telling when that material is gonna actually make it to their site. So talk with your design professionals and contractors about identifying materials that might be laid as soon as possible. It's important to know what items are the long lead items so that you can identify the impact of those delays to the project cost and schedule. Evaluate if there are locally sourced alternatives, those that are, might be available that can minimize disruptions to the schedule. And if cost increases are incurred, it's important for you to understand how that will impact your project's contingency and ultimately your construction loan. Laura, speaking of design professionals, are you seeing talk of architects thinking through common spaces and other building space with respect to COVID-19? Yeah, absolutely. Without a doubt, COVID-19 is bringing an increased need for physical distancing that will redefine community space for quite some time. So for your existing space, it's important to establish guidelines for your residents that address both new density limits as well as cleaning protocols. 
whether it is a social gathering space, an outdoor patio, or a fitness center, consider requiring advanced sign-up to use the space, removing some of the available furniture or equipment to accommodate reduced numbers, and having sanitizing supplies in place for residents to use after each use. Now, crisis creates opportunity for innovation. And right now, we are seeing the design and building community respond with new standards, products, and materials to meet heightened safety and health requirements, such as plexiglass windows at the front desk, touchless features for entryways and shared sinks, and utilization of antimicrobial building materials. One of the architects I spoke with this week suggested that with the current concerns about too many people in tight spaces and recirculating air, the solution might just be the opposite, larger spaces, more fresh air, natural materials, et cetera. So if you have a project currently in the planning phase, now is the time to talk with your design professionals about interior revisions. What do they recommend to help you meet the new health guidelines and your residents' preferences? Laura, thanks a lot for that good information. And another note, timeline and construction completion dates have had a lot of discussion. I really like your point uh, in your last uh, session about crisis creates opportunities for innovation. When looking at, uh, do you have ideas or tips around being proactive and planning, you know, when our apartment owners need to get an apartment project placed in, in service by a certain date? Yeah, Don, as, you know, as we already discussed, this pandemic has disrupted both workforce and material availability, making it very important that developers stay closely connected with their contractors on their projects to identify scheduled delays as early as possible. This is where some contractors are utilizing multiple shifts of workers or prefabrication as a solution to avoid future disruptions to schedules. And as it relates to schedules being delayed, some building owners are seeing this as an opportunity to get their project started earlier. If they selected a contractor for a project that's not yet underway, maybe they can accelerate their project schedule to take advantage of the contractor's availability. That's great. One, Laura, one really quick follow-up on around timing of placing and service. We've seen and heard from many municipalities that they're having staff be, be on furlough. Are you seeing issues with getting building inspections and certificate of occupancy uh, issued? Yeah, this is absolutely an issue right now across the country. Uh, you know, private industry wasn't the only one to feel the impact of the pandemic, and governmental agencies at the local, state, and national level are all dealing with delays. In order for you to receive your occupancy permit, you need to have the inspections and approval happen as planned. So stay connected with your local municipalities to understand the delays that they're facing. Understanding this in advance and knowing how the inspections and approvals might be impacted allows you an opportunity to plan ahead and to adjust your schedules accordingly so that you can meet your target dates. So Laura, I, I guess up to this point, we've kind of really centered around timing and, and sort of design specifications, et cetera. Um, but specifically dealing with the actual contracts, what are you seeing in terms of how current contracts are being dealt with in the context of, of force majeure clauses? And how do you think this pandemic affects contracts moving forward? You know, thanks, Garrick. As we've discussed, COVID-19 has resulted in many projects halting or being significantly delayed due to supply chain or workforce disruption. While I'm not qualified to offer legal advice, now is the time that developers should be reviewing their contracts and consider how the contracts delay, time extension, or force majeure clause allocate risk between the parties. Force majeure is a common clause in contracts that frees both parties from liability or obligation when an extraordinary event or circumstance beyond control or as an act of God prevents one from fulfilling their contractual obligations. Our construction team at Baker Tilly had a call with an attorney recently to discuss force majeure, and he claimed that in all his years of practicing, he had never dealt with this issue, but now it is the conversation with all of his construction clients as they seek to understand if COVID-19 constitute, constitutes a force majeure event. You know, the industry standards of AIA or consensus documents for contracts do not have specific force majeure clauses, but do include an excusable delay clause that could be applied to COVID-19 impacts and delays. With all of this uncertainty around who holds responsibility for COVID-19 delays, 
the legal system will be forced to evaluate force majeure under three conditions. The contract language, the documented facts of what happened on the project, and the relationship between COVID-19 and the relief sought. We recommend that you clarify if epidemic, pandemic, or illness is specified, is specifically identified in your force majeure clause. If not, does your clause include act of God or natural disaster? We encourage you to have open and transparent conversations with your contractor to identify and document schedule or cost impact. And our team right now is working on developing that list of recommended documentation that we believe contractors and building owners will need to provide in order to document harm from COVID-19. Moving forward, we believe that contractual language should be revised to better define force majeure. And we recommend that you consult with your attorney on revising your standard contracts to protect your business and ensure fairness to you and your business partners. Thanks, Laura. That's, that, that's good stuff. That, that was enough for me. <laughs> we know that, un, uh, unfortunately, too, a, a lot of businesses are having difficulties during the pandemic. Is there anything a developer should be doing differently when vetting a potential contractor for a job? Yeah, absolutely. Contractor pre-qualification is a best practice that we always have recommended developers follow as it's a really crucial form of risk management. Many developers have conducted a pre-qualification process after the last recession in order to evaluate the financial viability of their contractors. But we recommend that reviewing qualifications is an ongoing process, which is going to be especially important today moving forward. While every business has been impacted financially by the pandemic, an effective qualification process also considers their safety and overall business stability. So what does business stability mean? Well, check the business history of new disputes or litigation. What is the history there? Their licensure status, if it's required in your state, and any changes to ownership structure, including affiliates or subsidiary businesses. Understanding if there have been any major changes in business history during the last few months can give you a sign if there's instability in the future. We hope that safety is one of the top priorities you consider when hiring a contractor. While OSHA records can provide insight on past performance, today's environment requires, requires new safety protocols that you should be requesting and reviewing before you select a contractor. And normal questions about finances are still very relevant, but more emphasis should be placed on capacity, backlog, and payment practices. Criteria that can help you assess the amount of risk you might acquire if you hire them. Risk management. That's the main reason you should follow a pre or a re-qualification process. Thanks again for that, Laura. And as we wrap up today's Buzz House, we want to thank Laura Cataldo for her insight around considerations of your construction process during the pandemic. We put together a PDF of these action steps to take during the construction process and it is available on our website at bakerfilly.com. For any questions around these topics, please reach out to Laura. Thank you again for tuning in today and feel free to reach out to Garrick or myself with any questions about today's podcast or brainstorm in general around any of your multifamily projects. Also, please check out bakerfilly.com for many resources around COVID-19. And again, if you have any suggested topics, please send them to build at bakerfilly.com. That's B-U-I-L-D at bakerfilly.com. Thank you for joining us today. To receive notification when new episodes become available, please subscribe to Baker Tilly US wherever you get your podcasts.